Hello, everyone. Uh, today uh, we speak with uh, the Sw uh, Swedish author uh, Mons Kalentoft, who wrote um, Simi Fall. This is the Romanian edition. Um, uh, Mr. Kalentoft, uh, welcome to Romania. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> First time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe next year <laughs> we will have you uh, live uh, with yeah, yeah. readers. Yeah, but sure, then, sure. Um, I want to, uh, to ask you a few questions about this book. Yes. Uh, what is the background story for Simi Fall? The background is it's set in Mallorca. And it's a story about uh, a young girl. She goes there for a graduation. Um, she's 16. She goes for a graduation trip with her friends. And after one night of party, she disappears. And her father, uh, he goes to Mallorca to look for her. And the story starts when she's been gone three years. He's still looking. And it's a story about, you know, how this island and maybe the whole world is like a paradise lost. It's very beautiful and, 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 and sunny here, but behind the scenes, it's like a lot of corruption and drugs and prostitution. And, and it, it's, it's not what it seems. So it's a story about his, his search for his daughter and trying to unite their family and about for the backdrop for the, you know, uh, a part of Mallorca you never see, really. Okay. Uh, how was it to step in the shoes of a father whose daughter disappears, you being yourself a uh, father of a teenager? And uh, that... It was... It's like I... Sometimes I've done that <laughs> a few times. I try to write myself away from my own fears. So it really was, you know, to really confront my own fears because she was in that age where she was partying. She still is uh, where she's partying in the same places. And I've been out many sleepless nights, but so it, it was, uh, it's, for me, it's always been a way to, to come over my fears to write about them in, in, in the ways of literature, you know, confront them. So it's, and it's good because you have to go really deep into really, you know, difficult emotions. Yeah, and it's a creative way to confront your fears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so. Um, so you, you described the rotten paradise of Mallorca and um, this uh, lost father, Tim Blank, uh, yeah. You make him uh, go in different places, and yeah. in the book, I felt that I could uh, put pins on the map of Mallorca and make. A <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a round trip. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, how how did you discover the uh, not so famous parts of Mallorca? It's it's some. Um, it was I moved here. Uh, I knew it's Spain, it's a lot of corruption, it, especially in certain areas. It is, oh. It's good. And Mallorca was famous, since I know Spain before, uh, was quite famous for corruption. <laughs> but when I came here, I realized it went much deeper than I thought. And, you know, in Sweden, we're quite innocent because there is not much corruption. There's never been. And, but here, you know, it was a lot of they have the three police forces here, different. Guardia Civil, Policia Local, and, and Policia Nacional, and they are all corrupt. I didn't realize this. I, you know, they, they, they were, there were so many stories in the newspapers among people about you know, corrupt politicians mingling with uh, corrupt police and who were you know, having parties with the biggest drug dealers and, you know, getting free cocaine and free women. It, it, it was, and it was all more or less in the public and everyone knew this story. So I was like, wow, it's, it, it's much worse than I could ever imagine. And it could be a perfect back, backdrop for a crime story. Because if you have, you know, the, a very high politician, the head of police, 
who are friends with the biggest drug dealers. You know, something is going to go really wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I have the feeling that you would, will find Romania and Bucharest fascinating because... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> I know a little bit, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not super clean, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No. We we have uh, our stories. <laughs> yeah, I seen the famous uh, documentary, the collective. Why? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I've seen. I know it's it's horrible. It's it's you need the journalists, right? Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, because the because the second book of this duology is uh, still in, in translation yeah. uh, for us. Um, Please uh, tell us just a bit from from the second volume. Would be a uh, uh... Mm, uh, I can't tell too much because I will spoil. But it's it's you know it it it, it goes further into maybe more. It's still set in Spain, but also on the mainland, and it goes into to you know a bit more of the political political questions about the far right who's growing here in Spain as everywhere else in Europe and what that means and, and why and how it, how it can, you know, affect people's lives and how it has affected maybe Tim Blanc's life and his wife Rebecca's um, uh, life. And um, so I, I cannot say too much because I okay. didn't spoil the first book. Yeah, no, but it's... It, it's the same where I try to, you know, write, write about contemporary world in a poetic way, I would say, but also very hard. Yeah, yeah it's hard. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to Malin Force now. Yeah. Uh, the main character of a series of 13 books so far. Yeah. Um, why did you choose a woman as, a, as your main detective? And how was it to, to write from a, a woman's perspective and in the first person? I, I think it was a huge effort. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I always, since my first book, I've been, I, I've been asked this question quite a few times. But for me, if you're a writer, you should, um, you should be able to write about both a man, a woman, a child, and from all perspectives. It's like, it's like that kind of compassion and eye is like, um, you have to be able to do it and you should want to do it. And also at the time, this is quite a few years back now, it was only in this Scandinavian crime scene. It was mostly old men detectives like Valander and, uh, and yeah, they were all old men. So I w thought, uh, if I take a young woman instead, and she has the same problems, you know, drinking, works too much, a bit crazy, bad parent, life full of shame. What happens if we take this beloved character, but she's a young woman instead. So, so, it, so it, for me, it was like a, like a bit of a game also. But also, in, uh, I, for me, it's important that, that I'm able to write about, you know, everything in all characters. If I want to write about a black child in Africa, I should, you know, it's my right. Because now that right is in question, which is completely crazy. It, from my maybe old fashioned perspective, I think there can more or less be no culture appropriation. If I want to write about Bucharest, I should be able to go and live in Bucharest and write from a Romanian woman's perspective. It, it's, I should do this, actually. It's um, because that's literature and art, you know, it's about communicating and trying to understand each other and wanting to understand each other. But if we close all the doors, there will only be more polarization. I'm 100% sure of this. Yeah. So, uh, before you uh, start to write a book, uh, do you do uh, uh, some kind of research? Um, how yeah, does this process uh, go? Yeah, sometimes, um, but not so much. I do more research uh, 
uh, as I go along. And my theory has always been, you know, it shouldn't be too technical because, you know, it, it's always the characters who, who are interesting, not, you know, the, not so much the technical or the facts. Of course, it should be right, the facts, but it, you know, it's not that important. We care about the characters first and foremost. Uh, so, so I'm not one of the writers who do a lot of research. And, no, I, I look at people. It, it's my research, I would say, <laughs> and language. What does language mean? It, it, it's much more interesting than, you know, than criminology or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I think the Nordic noir uh, uh, genre uh, has changed in the past years because. All the uh, novels you you write, so you and other Scandinavian writers, um, are more than a crime story or a mystery. They have social, uh, um, I don't know, social uh, uh, comments about uh, different things. They yeah. have, uh, I don't know, political opinion. They have uh many 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 issues that are uh beyond fiction yeah 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 i think so very much uh some more than others but it's it's uh it's true i think it becomes more and more and um but also we have also now a trend you know the audiobooks are getting very big yes. in sweden and and in the audiobooks it's the stories tend to become um more and more stupid also <laughs> because it, 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 it's different to listen than to read it is a big difference at least in my opinion so i think we have a polarization between writers who, who do these more complex stories and some are you know who do the more direct for audio and and that is usually a bit more simple doesn't have to be bad but it's different it, it's less complex when it comes to language and story and layering and character and, you know, it doesn't imitate life as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> indeed. So uh, you write alone, but also you had some uh, collaborations with Marcus yeah. Luthermann and others. Uh, yeah. What does the experience of collaborative writing uh, bring to a writer? Or to you. For me, uh, when I did this, it brought like new perspectives, as like you can think. You know, I had another brain to pick and sometimes discuss with. And, and because I, I felt I'd written many books and had quite, you know, good success. And I thought I was getting better. But then it was very, very close, the whole process. And I figured, I want to change everything. With this, with this, with this. So it, so it was like, I, I wanted to make it as open as possible and, and bring in one other writer was, you know, the, the, the clearest way to do this. And, you know, show the storylines to the publishers at a very early stage, test them on people. I mean, just open up the whole process. And um, I don't know, I'm not sure what I learned from it, but <laughs> <laughs> because now I'm back at writing only by myself. But it's, it's, um, yeah, uh, and it's good to get, you know, other people's perspectives on, on storytelling and writing, and, yeah. So uh, now you live in uh, Mallorca. Yeah. Um, why did you move from Sweden? For creative purposes, uh, it was... Uh, uh, <laughs> Climate purposes. Chasing the sun? <laughs> yeah, both, I think. Both, I think, uh, to be honest. A bit chasing the sun. Of course, it's, it's so much better, the weather. <laughs> uh, um, and also for creative purposes, because I live in Stockholm and, you know, Sweden, and I don't know how it works in Romania, but, you know, the creative circles and the literature is all in Stockholm, all the journey. It's very, very focused. So... Uh, I was like never alone, I felt like every day someone wants to have lunch, 
So I wanted to get away to be, you know, left alone writing, not getting disturbed the whole time. Uh, you know, being completely anonymous because I was a bit on television shows for a while. So people started recognizing me on the street, you know, there he is, and I hated it. It was the worst experience. <laughs> so I really wanted to take some step back and become, you know, only focus on, on, on writing and a few, you know, kids and, you know. And uh, how was this past year for you? How did pandemic affected your uh, life, your we were, writing? We were in lockdown for three months. You could only go to the grocery yeah. store and the pharmacy. And for the first weeks, I could write very well. And then it became like slowly. But and then you were just sitting in the sofa watching Netflix. It, it was very hard. And that was like for four or five weeks. Uh, I didn't write anything, which is very unlike me. I usually write the whole time. But then I came out of that and wrote a lot like the last four or five weeks. So it was, uh, yeah, it was just weird. It just went on and on and on. <laughs> so, but then after that, it's, it's been mostly boring, I think. And, um, and not very creative because you need, I need input. I usually travel quite a lot. Now, you know, it's not so much travel. It's super complicated. Um, uh, so, oh well, it's, but I don't think I've learned that much. I don't know. We'll see in a few years what you learn about. It's not good for stories, a closed world, I think. Yeah. My method has always been, you know, go somewhere go, or out in the street and look at people and listening to people and be, you know, be in the world and see what stories come comes to you. So, so and, and, and so far we haven't seen much interesting art coming out of the pandemic. It's, not it's, yet. <laughs> no, it's not good for stories, <laughs> really. Uh, we will see. We will see. Yeah, we'll see. because you mentioned travel. Yeah. Um, um, where would you go first after this whole pandemic ends? I don't know. I want to go to Paris, I think. <laughs> Have a drink. <laughs> or, or to Asia. I, miss, I usually go to Asia maybe once a year. And usually for you know, a long time I have friends who live there. And it's, it's just different also. It's very different, the, the atmosphere and the pulse in Southeast Asia. I miss it quite a lot, just, you know, <laughs> the insane, you know, it's, it's another world. Well, I guess your passion for um, um, gourmet food, uh, and food. <laughs> uh, um, gave you some, some special experiences. Uh, could you share us, share with us some? Um... I was, you know, since I was very young, I always loved eating. And then when I discovered restaurants, I loved going to restaurants. And then I started, you know, to, to be able to afford going to all the restaurants. <laughs> uh, I started to write about, um, to start about writing, writing about restaurants and travel and uh, so you meet a lot of crazy, crazy chefs and, and a lot of great fun, actually. Um, and I wrote for magazines and it was crazy. It was, it was, I had so much fun and ate so much good food all <laughs> over the world. It was like the perfect job. Uh, and then I got older and, I, you know, the family it doesn't mix so well with family, this lifestyle. And also Instagram happened. So now it's, you know, you, 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 there is no, not much that kind of travel writing and food writing anymore. Now it's more an influencer to take a picture of, of a plate. And, <laughs> so it, it, so to that, that's not for me actually, but I still love, love the world of restaurants and, you know, sitting at the bar, drinking martinis and, you know, in good company. It's very much, it's something, it's like the core of my life that, you know, when you have the great discussions over a table and, you know, that comes and goes and it 
turns into a magical night. It's, 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 very, it's very much the heart of life. One, one, yeah. So, yeah. And I missed restaurants a lot the last year with COVID when everything's been closed. And it's not the same to be at someone's house. You, know, it's, it's, you want a room where you, there are strangers and, you know, yeah, and the chit chat, yeah. and the sound, the sound of a restaurant. It's, uh, you know, it, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, because we we already spoke about um, how the Nordic noir genre has changed. Yeah, has changed. Um, there are some social themes, or um, I don't know, subject you would want to approach in your next books. Um, uh, whew, that's a very good question. Yeah, I'm very interested in what happens after the pandemic right now. And I think we're going to go into an age of decadence, like real decadence. I hope so. So I'm really interested now in to exploit what can decadence be you know, in our age, you know, where, yeah. where where, you know, it, it, because it goes against some of the very political correct trends, you know, with, with environment and inclusivity and, you know, decadence is not very democratic usually. It, it's opposite of that. So, so uh, that's what I want to write about, I think. And I know something about the subject from all my travels in the food and the gastronomic world and, 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 and the luxury places. <laughs> I've seen it. I'm not a personal expert, but almost probably. <laughs> so, so I feel I feel like I'm in a good position to to write about, you know, contemporary life in the next five six years. I hope, <laughs> if nothing happens. Great, great. So, um, you if you were not a writer or a journalist, uh, what career would you choose? Uh, I don't know, actually. It's a good question. Probably something in, 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 in the, maybe not restaurants or, or not finance or, or probably something, something where you tell stories. But, but outside of that, I, I, I don't know, actually. Uh, it is difficult. Maybe I would chase the money and become a banker or something. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, I'm really not that type at all, actually. Uh, no, it's, I mean, thinking about this, what I can do. I have no idea, actually. But you can do many things in, in life if you have to. I mean, I would like to have, you know, my freedom at least still. Not like a normal job. <laughs> it would be difficult now after... 20 years as a free writer, it would be very hard for, you know, to go back to the office. And I think that would be <laughs> very difficult. Do you see um, yourself growing old in Mallorca or maybe after some years you will choose another place? I think I have my children here in school and they have a few years left of school, like three years. My son, my daughter is moving now. Uh, and then I think I will, um, I think I will, um, I think I will leave Mallorca after that. Yeah. I, and going back to Sweden or to another? No, I hope never, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. And now, I don't know, maybe travel again. Kids are grown, you know, very, very uh, moving lifestyle. I mean, in the mood for maybe, you know, just, drift for a few years, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, and you know, not really have a home. <laughs> I don't do that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It, we, we'll see. It's, it's, it's my plan, but, but, you know, life happens, so. Um, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And Paris is always Paris, yeah? yeah. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you for having me. Uh, we are expecting you in Bucharest whenever you... Yeah, yeah I would love to come. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. So, or whenever you want. 
Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it seems a very interesting place. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I like it actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank and, you for uh, having me. Yeah, it was fun. I enjoyed very much. We'll see you in Bucharest. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.